Coming up on DTNS, how to clone someone's security key. Roku buys some Quibi. And will Hyundai make the Apple car? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 8th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. We were just talking uh, about a CES product that makes you ice cream in 90 seconds whenever mm. you want it and why Roger never cries. <laughs> if you want that wider conversation, join our expanded show, Good Day Internet, at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Amazon has discontinued its Prime Pantry Grocery and Household Item Service. Products previously available in Pantry will now be available like any other product on Amazon, so it's not going away altogether, but the service itself. Prime Pantry launched in 2014, offering reduced shipping on up to 45 pounds of household goods for a monthly fee. Amazon notified Prime pa Pantry subscribers about the closure in December and then issued refunds. The UK's Competition and Markets Authority launched an investigation into Google's privacy sandbox that would block third-party cookies in Chrome. The regulator received complaints from the marketers for an open web coalition saying the plan would abuse Google's dominant position in online advertising. So the investigation is going to evaluate if the privacy sandbox changes would concentrate advertising spending market share with Google. Samsung launched the Galaxy Chromebook 2, a cheaper version of the Galaxy Chromebook it launched last year. So instead of 4K, it has a 1080p LCD screen with less storage, fewer cameras, less RAM. It's also heavier and thicker overall. But it also now starts at $549 instead of $1,000. It has a 13.3 inch 1920 by 1080 16 by 9 LCD touchscreen with a dual core Intel Celeron 525U upgradable to an Intel Core i3 10, 10, 11, oh, 10, 10 1, 1, 0 u 8 gigs of RAM and 125 gigs of storage for $699. A shortage of semiconductors is affecting automakers. Volkswagen said last month that they needed to adjust first quarter manufacturing plans around the globe because of the shortage. Now Honda says it will cut domestic output by about 4,000 cars this month at one of its factories in Japan. Nissan is adjusting production numbers for its Note hatchback model, and Ford has moved up previously planned downtime at a Kentucky plant for its sport utility vehicle factory due to a shortage in chips. All right. While we're talking about cars, let's talk about the Apple car. Yeah, a lot of rumors as of late. Well, really over the last few years, but uh, but but the rumors had resurfaced recently, and Hyundai is now talking to Apple about cars. So says the company. A Hyundai representative told CNBC, quote, We understand that Apple is in discussion with a variety of global automakers, including Hyundai Motor. As the discussion is at its early stage, nothing has been decided. Korean Economic Daily said that Apple suggested the arrangement and Hyundai was reviewing the terms that involved EV production and also battery development. Hyundai has had its own battery EV platform called eGMP going into production later this year, so Apple might be saying, well, you might know what you're doing. Reuters sources say that Apple would like to produce a passenger vehicle by 2024. However... Eh, it might not be the actual date. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports an autonomous EV from Apple is five to seven years away. And Ming-Chi Kuo recently said he wouldn't be surprised if it takes until 2028. Yeah, so what's probably going on here is Apple, and I think this is the significant part, has decided to start investigating how they would build whatever it is they're going to build, whether it's a whole car or an integrated platform. And they're going to different manufacturers and parts suppliers and folks like Magna, including Hyundai, and saying, what do you got? How can you help us with this? And Hyundai is a great company for this because they make parts, they make systems, they make full cars. There's all kinds of services in the Hyundai company that could play a part with Apple. So it may not be that Apple knows what they want from Hyundai. It may just be that they're going and saying, hey, let's talk. You do a lot of the kinds of things that we think we're going to need. I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, I just got my first Hyundai ever this year. And my first perception of this story was, wait, but Hyundai currently uses Android Auto in a lot of their 
their uh, cars. So I would love to see how Apple would integrate uh, Hyundai's current technologies into something that is very useful for the Apple ecosystem, not just, you know, looking at EV itself, but also, you know, the, uh, the, the systems inside of it, the controls and how they would manage that for a driver and a passenger in the car. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the big questions that I have is, okay, let's just say, let's say it's Hyundai that that Apple ends up working with. Clearly not set in stone, at least from what we know at this point, but let's no. just say it's that company. Yeah, just, just for kicks, let's imagine that that's what yeah. it is. Yeah, is it is it an Apple car that Hyundai produces a lot of parts for, the way that Apple works with lots of other companies to produce other hardware for Apple? I mean, that that's the loftiest kind of goal that we're looking at. And maybe that would take till 2028, at, you know, if, if, if Apple was lucky. I think it probably has more to do with, like you said, Shannon, not that, you know, Android Auto wouldn't still be prevalent in a lot of passenger vehicles, but maybe it's some sort of, it's a special relationship. It's a, it's a special kind of OS inside a car that is supposed to, you know, I don't know, move some merch because uh, what Apple is providing on the software side is 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 that much more interesting i really don't know if you look at that bloomberg article mark german's sources are saying that uh, all those tesla people that apple has hired are working on things like interior exterior drivetrain uh you know stereo assist the kinds of things you need when you're building a car not a car. just providing yeah. a software platform so then the question becomes is it the apple car period, maybe Hyundai makes it, maybe somebody else makes it, and you know they'll figure out how to distribute it. Or is it the Apple car by Hyundai, and you go to a Hyundai dealership to buy it the way you went to an AT&T store to buy an Apple iPhone, but it's really Apple's car in cooperation with Hyundai. Are there multiple partners? I mean, that that's all the kind of stuff we're waiting to see. But it, it really does feel like we have gotten to the point where this is no longer just yeah, they're working on Project Titan. They don't know what they're going to do, too. They have an idea. It, it's more than just software, and they're working out the details. Maybe they don't even know that yet. Yeah. Well, I'm interested to see what happens, but we also have some other news. Yay, security. <laughs> Among the systems impacted by the solar winds attack is the electronic filing system used by the U.S. federal courts. An investigation is underway to determine if confidentiality of documents filed with the courts was breached. And as a result, starting Wednesday, confidential documents filed with the courts will be stored on standalone systems, not uploaded. Big difference. So these are documents sealed from public access because they can contain sensitive information like investigative techniques, identities of informants, and a lot more. Other U.S. federal agencies affected included the Justice Department, the State Treasury, and Energy Departments as well. So SolarWinds has engaged the Krebs Stamos Security Consulting Group to help deal with this attack. That firm was formed by Alex Stamos, the former chief security officer at Yahoo and Facebook, and Chris Krebs, the former director of the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. So Krebs was fired last month by the president after finding no evidence of tampering with voting systems in the 2020 election. Uh, yeah, Krebs Stamos, first of all, brilliant for those two to team up uh, and smart for solar winds to engage them for what they say is uh, helping with transparency with companies that are affected. Uh, but this, we, we are not done finding out how bad this is. Uh, there are reports that there may have been other ways that this, whoever is behind this, intruded beyond just solar winds. Uh, that they're finding evidence of that. Uh, they have not been able to root out the people that got in through this vulnerability from all systems yet. They're still in there in a lot of cases. Uh, and you know, this this kind of confidential information is exactly the kind of thing you fear that someone would get by intruding into a government system. Uh, you know, informants, investigative techniques that you can now learn from to evade uh, being prosecuted or caught yourself. Uh, this that's that's crown jewel type stuff. It's uh it's very interesting. In fact, Krebs 
uh, spoke on record saying that it, it could potentially take years to figure out how deep the solar winds attack actually went and how many different kinds of uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, brands and everything that it might have affected. So this is not something that's going to die anytime soon. I'm glad that they are uh, reaching out to Craig's and Stamos, though, because that, yeah, I, I agree with you, Tom. It's an excellent, excellent team. Roku made a few interesting announcements. Roku says NPD data shows that the Roku S OS was the top selling smart TV operating system in the US and Canada in 2020. 31% market share in Canada, 38% in the United States. Uh, that pushes Samsung's Tizen to number two, at least. We don't actually know, but Samsung's Tizen was number one in 2019. Roku also announced a wireless soundbar reference design that uses Wi-Fi for its Roku TV Ready program. Remember last year, Roku announced the program which had a design for wired soundbars. Uh, the program includes TCL, Poke and Denon, and Element has just announced it'll join as well with 2.0 and 2.1 Ready soundbars. Roku TV Ready is going to expand internationally later this year as well. But here's the big Roku news. Roku has agreed to acquire exclusive global distribution rights to more than 75 Quibi shows and documentaries, some of which had not been released before Quibi shut down. So there'll be some new stuff that nobody's ever seen. After their exclusivity deal expires, that'll happen in a bit more than a year, depending on the show, Roku will still have the rights to show the content, just not exclusively, until 2027. The content will have to be presented in original increments of 10 minutes or less. The deal doesn't let them stitch it all together. The content will be added to the more than 40,000 movies and TV shows already available in the Roku channel. Uh, shows include, from Quibi anyway, Punked, Murder House Flip, and Dummy, which stars Anna Kendrick. Oh, I never watched the new Punked. Uh, I heard it had its moments. The whole Quibi thing, it's really interesting to me because it was sort of like... It crashed and burned so quickly, and there's a lot of schadenfreude around you know, folks in the industry about it. And I think that's not because Quibi was doing things wrong. It was because the company had raised so much money ahead of time because you know they had Meg Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg, uh, who were you know heavy hitters. And there was a little bit of like, you are being too ambitious, and therefore you shall fail. The company did fail. Uh, and the idea that some creators will have a new life on another platform, you know, shows that just nobody even saw, but people still worked on and maybe are really good. I think this, this makes a lot of sense and, you know, good, good for Roku to get exclusivity for at least a few years. So does Roku have to wait at all in order to start showing this content or can it happen immediately? I, I don't know when the start date, whenever the deal is you know, goes into effect, then they'll immediately be able to, to show it. So, you know, within a month or so, uh, it would be my guess anyway. But no, they, they don't have, once the deal is actually in effect, they don't have to wait. What's going on here is that the Quibi production companies own the rights to their own stuff but they have a two-year exclusive for each one of their shows with Quibi, and those two-year exclusives are now being transferred to Roku. So Roku will be able to have the exclusive for the remainder of whatever the period was with Quibi. That's why it's oh. a year or more. Uh, and then yeah. once the two-year exclusivity goes away, then they still have the right to show it until 2027, but the production companies that made it can now start shopping it around to other places as well. Uh, so the, the production companies do hold the content. And remember, this is just the content. Quibi is still in a lawsuit over its turnstile technology, which is holding it up from selling its technology. And I would expect once it resolves that lawsuit, should it resolve it in a way that they still hold their technology, they'll sell that too. So this isn't the last you're going to hear of Quibi selling off a part of it, I, I would imagine. Gotcha. Yeah, that whole the whole technology part of Quibi was again, Quibi was an ambitious thing that was released at a very inopportune time uh in 2020 <laughs> when, you know, everyone was like we're just sitting at home, like we don't need this like uh mobile phone technology. It's like cool that you can shift it around, but you can't even cast it to anything. Yeah. I mean, the company did fix that, you know, great when afterwards. you're out and about. Oh, wait, no one's allowed yeah. out and about. It was Shoot. just, I mean, it's just, it just, it just, the timing couldn't be worse. Yeah. But that technology, when you think of it in a variety of other form factors, such as monitors that swivel, we talked mm -hmm. about some of those yesterday. I don't know that, you know, Quibi or TikTok or Snapchat or, you know, all of the stuff where we're like, oh yeah, that's the, that's the portrait view rather than landscape view that 
works for certain apps is 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 all that this is for. I think there's more to it. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and there's patents and things that are always valuable because you can use those to make, to extract some concessions and money and stuff. So yeah, expect that all to come. Join in the conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account. Get in there and talk about your favorite Quibi shows with all the other Discord folks. Uh, <laughs> just link it to your Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, Shannon, how do you clone a security key? <laughs> well, first I will say, please do not stop using your security keys because of this story. Uh, I will explain in a bit. <laughs> Researchers from Ninja Lab published a paper on Thursday showing how you could clone a Google Titan security key. This is a two-factor authentication key, which is very similar to a YubiKey that you have to plug in or tap in order to access an account after putting in your username or your password credentials or both. So in order to pull off the clone, you would need physical access to the key for about 10 hours, sometimes a minimum of 10 hours, just kind of depends on how good you are at this, about $12,000 worth of equipment, physical equipment, and custom software, and some advanced skills in electrical engineering and cryptography as well. So you have to remove the chip and then take measurements of it at uh, being registered on each account that you want to attack. The measurements observe electromagnetic radiation as the chip generates digital signatures that let the attacker slowly deduce the private key. So measurements take about six hours per account. That's not including taking apart the original Titan security key, putting it back together. Then you need to seal the chip back into its case. You also need the target's password in order for this to work. So the reason it works is because of a vulnerability in the security hardware chip residing within the Google Titan key. And that is called an A700X by this company called NXP. If it's exploited, an attacker could grab the elliptic curve cryptographic private key for the account. And this same chip is actually found in other two-factor authentication authentication physical tokens as well, like uh, there's a YubiKey that it's found in, but chances of attack are very, very minimal given the scope of the attack. So if you do all of this without the target ever noticing, then they would never know you had duplicated the key. But again, given the scope, given how much it costs and everything behind the scenes, probably wouldn't happen to a normal user. Yeah, the, the point of these security keys uh, being the best way to use for two factor is that you can't even get at your private key, right? You, nobody yes. is supposed to be able to get in there. Like the chip just doesn't make it available. So the fact that they were able to get in there and get it is huge, right? Yes. Practicality or no, the fact that they were able to do this is significant. But I mean, if you're not a target of an advanced persistent threat, you don't need to worry about this. No one's yeah. going to go to the trouble to do this. And even if you're a target, I would guess, Shannon, that most of them probably would be able to notice if someone took their key for 10 hours or more. You you likely, likely would, especially since a lot of people with hardware tokens like the Google Titan will stick them on a uh, on their keychain, for example, like with their house keys or whatever, wherever they keep all those personal uh, physical devices that they don't want lost or stolen. They keep them all on a keychain. So if somebody was to take one of these out of your purse, out of your gym locker, wherever it might be, and remove it for like 10 hours straight minimum, you would likely know that this would have happened. Uh, the neat thing about these chips inside of these Google Titan security keys and any other cryptographic uh, hardware tokens like these is that even the manufacturer doesn't know the private key. So the fact that they were able to find a vulnerability on these specific chipsets is really interesting. And I think that's the important bit of that is, is even though the Google Titan is like the end all be all of really excellent two factor authentication, there's always the potential that vulnerabilities can be found. So I'm happy that this research came out. It's so fascinating and it's so interesting. And this means that NXP and and other security chipset manufacturers uh, that sell these teeny tiny chips to you know Google or Yubico or whoever the company might be, uh, they can build on this. They can research and figure out what the next version of their chipset needs to entail in order to not be vulnerable to this again in the future. Yeah, I mean, this is really a good security story, right? It says, yeah. 
we finally figured out, because there's always a way, right? We finally figured out the way you could get the private key out of a security key. And guess what? It's really hard, takes a long time. And now that we know it, we can make it even harder uh, and, and hopefully, you know, push that barrier out even farther. And even if somebody did have time to do this and you didn't notice, uh, I was reading the paper because I'm a huge nerd and they go as far as using fuming, fuming nitric acid in order to get like melt the epoxy off of the original Google Titan. How are you going to put that back together in order for somebody to not notice? Like there's a lot of intricacies yeah. with this attack in order for it to actually be pulled off. So chances are very, very slim that somebody would be able to pull off. So again, as I said at the very beginning, don't stop using your Google Titan security key if you have one. Keep using it because chances are you would never be attacked with this. Yeah. Just, just know if you haven't seen it in ten hours. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> you don't worry. It looks you glued together access. strangely. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, this is gonna be in a movie though. I'm calling that shot right now. We're gonna we're gonna see this in a movie where like I hope so. Somebody goes into surgery and they take his key and they go out and they do all this and they slip it back in because ten hours later he wakes up from anesthesia. I don't know. Something I like just that. hope they talk to the researchers so they actually show it off right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> me too. Uh, Sony made some TV and audio announcements, uh, starting with details for its OLED TV lineup, sticking with OLED. Uh, Bravia XR 4K and 8K TVs will support 4K at 120 hertz variable refresh rate, VRR, uh, as well as ALLM, auto low latency mode, and eARC. Uh, these are all things that are important if you got a PS5. Now you got a Sony TV that can go with it. Sony also has an improved AI chip that's going to improve the picture and can do some sound positioning so it aligns with what you see on the screen. Sony's Master Series TVs will come with a sensor that adjusts white balance to match your ambient color temp. You don't have to do anything. It'll just do it. Uh, also an aluminum heat shield that'll make for brighter OLED. All the sets will support HDMI 2.1, another big one for PS5, Dolby Vision HDR, and Google TV. Uh, Sony also announced its 360 reality audio platform. If you're not familiar, 360 degree audio places instruments and vocals in a virtual sound field around your head but using just the one speaker. So you can do this in an Amazon Echo or a Google Home. Sony will start streaming video with 360 audio later this year, starting with a concert from Zara Larson on January 11th. And Sony's gonna make its own speakers that support this. It'll be supported by other speakers as well, but Sony's gonna put out the RA5000 and RA3000. Uh, they've got that dark cloth surface that all these speakers seem to have these days with either bronze or silver accents work with Google and Amazon assistants, and can connect to select Sony Abravia TVs, as well as supporting Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Spotify Connect, and Google Cast. The speakers do automatic calibration to the room they're in. Don't have to press a button for that either. Uh, and will simulate 360 degree audio for stereo tracks as well. The RA5000 is gonna cost 500 pounds or 599 euros, no US price yet. And the 3000 will be 280 pounds, 359 euros. Uh, this seems this seems like it's shaping up to be one of the CES subtrends. Is this this sort of 360 degree audio while you're listening to your Blackpink? Yeah, <laughs> and it's just one speaker, or potentially a couple of speakers. Yeah, uh, in but, the speaker but, you have even maybe. Yeah, yeah. Some and, of the echoes already support it. Yeah, there's less of kind of like, oh, what do I, you know, do I have, do I have to do like 5.1 surround, or at least do get a couple speakers and make them a stereo pair type thing. You know, I I really haven't heard this in. You know, I don't know. I used to hang out at Magnolia at Best Buy all the time and just like geek out on stuff like this. Of course, this technology wasn't around at the time, but sometimes I'd be like, come on, come on, you know, let's let's turn on some stuff and see how, you know, what the speakers do. If it works well, then that's awesome. I mean, my first my first reaction because I got rid of my kind of fancy speakers some years ago because a friend of mine needed them more than I did and I didn't have room in, in my apartment. But I miss that. I'm also in a a apartment now that's smaller and kind of has a lot of weird angles and I find audio bounces off walls in ways that it wouldn't if it was more of a square box room. Um, so I'm not sure that I'm the perfect target market for this. Oh, you're but the test it, case. You're the one that puts this through its paces and sees if it really works. Yeah. So, yeah. If, if, it, if it could actually work as advertised, you know, again, with some funny angles and a big old A-frame, then I'm I'm really into this. And I've always been, I don't have a Sony TV currently. Sorry, Sony. But I was a Brav, Bravia person for years and years and years. I think um, what 
the new Bravia line is coming out with looks really nice. And I don't know. I mean, not totally in the market for a new TV, but I like the fact that I might get a new Sony again. Yeah, pair it up with a Sony speaker. You got 360 yeah. audio. Yeah, I already got all this Sono stuff. It's gonna be a mess any way you slice it. Uh. But <laughs> but I like the I like this 360 reality audio platform. Shannon, what what do you, what do you have set up in your house? I was straight up gonna mention Sonos because if if it doesn't have the connectability to be able to work with all of my other platforms that I currently have invested in, then chances are I wouldn't buy it. Um, so I do have Sonoses in my house, and I do have some issues connecting those with other speakers in the household too, like, like my Google hub, for example. <laughs> so the fact that this works with Google and Amazon assistant, the speakers specifically, uh, the audio speakers, I think that's pretty cool. I, I like that they are bringing that in and I am interested because I do live in a, a household that has very high ceilings, uh, how this would work in that kind of environment. So yeah, I'm very interested in the audio aspect. Well, you might also be interested in what Kohler has coming out. Oh, yes. Uh, the folks who make <laughs> things like toilets and bathtubs and sinks and lots of appliances. However, been a real CES mainstay for the last few years with some cool innovations. And this year is no different. Even though we're not in Vegas, Kohler has a new smart bathtub called the Stillness Bath that lets you use an app or use your voice using Google or Amazon's assistance to fill up the water or perhaps set the mood by changing the color of the lights around the tub or even add some fog, you know? You want to kind of pretend like you're in the fog, then you can do that. <laughs> Preset routines can also turn on features in a certain order. So if you want to get kind of creative, that's cool. You have a certain uh, amount of limitations with the base model and the base model is not cheap. So temperature and depth control models alone will cost around $8,698. That's right. It's almost a $9,000 bathtub. If you want the experience tower that lets you activate fog and aromatherapy, That'll run you just over $10,000. Both models are available in July. They're real things. And if you want the version with lights and floor grates for overflow, $15,998 available this October. Sign me off. I, I won't be buying this. No. Nope. Not even a little bit. Uh, ah, but we could but have taken a bath at CES in the new, <laughs> in the demo bathtub. <laughs> but in the, in the pre-show, Roger was like, why would you want fog? It's like, I don't know. This is cool. Why does anyone want Ambience. anything? Ambiance. Yeah, yeah, right. This you is know. this is going in the uh, luxury suites in hotels for sure, as yeah. well as rich people's houses. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Something. Well, it, it, yeah. It's it's that like, hey, look at what my bath can do, and people go, wow, very fancy. And then you know, ten years from now, we'll be like, remember when we thought it was fancy to talk to your bathtub <laughs> so that it would you know start filling up without you touching it? But uh, yeah, it's. It's somewhat silly because of the price, but I'm not really much of a bath person, but they do look very nice. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Nick wrote in with a pronunciation rant. Oh, Nick, you are not alone. <laughs> he says, Asus's ROG is an initialism because it's R-O-G, like FBI or CIA. People say it wrong. Yet their lower-end gaming brand, Tough, not an initialism. It's an acronym like SCUBA or POTUS. T-U-F, but pronounced tough. It's like aces can't make up their dang mind. Then there's Strix, which is an ROG subbrand. Strix is a word. It's a completely nonsensical made-up word, but it's a word, and you pronounce it as such. Nick says, honestly, as somebody that buys a lot of Asus hardware because I've rarely had a bad experience with them over the past 20 years, I am baffled by some of the branding decisions. The one that bugs me the most is the Strix subbrand. Sometimes Asus makes the Strix products the high-end product in the product stack, yet other times it's a mid-range product. Would it be too much to ask for consistency in product branding in 2021? Yes, apparently, yeah. <laughs> apparently yes. Uh, we feel your pain, Nick. That, I love that Nick was just like, I just need to vent with you guys. Let me, let me, let me get this off my chest. We appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you, Nick. I, uh, uh, every day is a fresh new hell when it comes to uh, reading out some, uh, some model numbers. <laughs> but you know what it is not is shouting out our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today they include Chris Smith, Martin James, and DeGracia A. Daniels. 
And of course, Len Peralta is back and illustrating the show. What have you drawn for us today, Len? Well, you know, I'm really excited to say that we've have the first image of the Apple <laughs> iCar. Uh, the iCar, which I'm that's what I'm calling it. Uh, I'm sure they're going to take my advice. Uh, coming around 2027 ish or so, maybe. Uh, you know, you may, if you're a fan of Richard Scarry's Busy World, you may be a very uh, uh, familiar with the look of this uh, of the Apple iCar. Um, I think it'll be big hit with uh, with fans uh, of people who have kids. Uh, so check it out. It's uh, this is called Meet iCar. Uh, and this is available right now on my Patreon, which, by the way, uh, has two new levels. If lets me be your, uh, let me be your um, uh, uh, teacher, your mentor with your artwork. I can give you some help that way at patreon.com forward slash Len. Plus, I also just launched a new product uh, called Flip Face Max, which is over at lenperaltstore.com. And I, I want to show you what that looks like. I did something special uh, for our, uh, for our, our friend oh. Shannon for snubs. Oh, uh, this, uh, this is a this is what the flip face flip face max looks like. Um, this is uh, it's a little bit higher uh, higher end than the normal flip faces you're used to, uh, but those are on the front page of my store at lenperaltostore.com. But this is for you, Shannon. Oh my gosh, uh, Len! If people want to see that, because most people are just listening to this, what should they do? Uh, go to uh, well, right now it's going to be on Twitter. It'll also be on Instagram later. But just go to lenperaltostore.com. Uh, you'll see uh, all the ones I've done over the past couple of weeks, and uh, uh, including uh, including Shannon's. So. It's so cute. It's really lovely. I mean, oh, it, it's yeah, that's adorable. Speaking <laughs> of Shannon Morse, uh, first show of 2021, certainly not the last. I know you're a busy lady. Where can people keep up with your work? Oh my gosh, I have been busy. YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse, just like my name. I just did a tech predictions video and it was so cool. I got like 18 up and coming tech YouTubers cool. to give me their 2021 tech predictions for the year. And there's some names in there that you that you definitely know. Aunt Pruitt, um, Miriam Tank Girl, Renee Ritchie. So I had a whole bunch of people join in and kind of give me their thoughts. And uh, it was very, very optimistic. And I was really happy to see that. So if you want to see that video and the rest of mine, check out my YouTube channel. Hey, folks, if you need just the headlines, uh, it's okay to skip a DTNS. We know you get busy. Check out our related show, Daily Tech Headlines, all the essential tech news in about five minutes at dailytechheadlines.com. We're live on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back Monday with Chris Ashley. Have a great weekend, all. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. The Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>